I'm Jonathan and you should also be able to see Emma that we're going to be speaking to today. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Um, as mentioned, today I'm going to be talking about revoking wills um, in England and Wales. Uh, just as a general note, wills are generally revocable. Um, there's obviously slight caveats to that in respect of mutual wills, uh, which are binding agreements not to change a will. And, and I suppose in certain circumstances, they, they can be regarded as irrevocable, uh, so that on the death of the survivor of the two testators um, and the one who has revoked his or her part of uh, the mutual will, um, that person's personal representatives may be directed to hold the property on trust for the beneficiaries under the revoked will. Um, but I'm just I'm just dealing with um, the four main methods of revocation. Um, so I'll just go to the next slide. So these are the main statutory methods uh, in the Wills Act 1837. Um, so a testator can generally revoke uh, his or her will um, by making a new will or codicil, by making a written declaration executed in the same way as a will, by destruction and by marriage or civil partnership. Now the first three are sort of, I could say, are grouped under kind of intentional heading, whereas the fourth is automatic on the occurrence of, of that event. I'd also just note that section 19 of the Wills Act um, prescribes that a will is not revoked by alteration of, of circumstances. So for example, the birth of a child. So looking at the first three methods, these are dealt with in section 20 of the Wills Act 1837. And the title of that provision is no will to be revoked, but by another will or codicil, or by writing executed like a will or by destruction. So first method, by another will or codicil executed in manner here and before required. Now this is probably the most significant practical method, um, the one we've probably seen most in, in new wills. Um, there's usually a revocation clause, for example. Um, for that new will to revoke the former will, uh, it must comply with the relevant formalities um, be duly executed by testator uh, with capacity and not subject to undue influence. Clearly, there's a number of practical issues, I suppose, when someone's making a new will that revokes a former will. And although I'm primarily de dealing with a position in England and Wales today, um, it may be worth obviously considering what happens if there's a foreign will or if there's foreign assets um, in, in a different jurisdiction um, and what's going to happen if the, a new will seeks to revoke those. And I'm going to come and touch on a case re a little later. Another sort of practical note, I suppose, is if a new will makes very, very different um, provisions in relation to a former will. And um, so if there's a very extreme divergence, for example, one beneficiary is favoured much more in the, in the later will than the former. And um, I suppose it's worth considering issues such as capacity, undue influence, that sort of thing. But dealing, dealing with this method of revocation, there's essentially two uh, subgroups of um, revoking by another will. There's express revocation and there's implied revocation. So dealing first with express revocation. Um, this is where the will uh, explicitly states that it's going to revoke all former testamentary dispositions uh, and generally um, it will revoke the former wills uh, but there's a caveat to that obviously because the scope of an express revocation clause i.e whether it's effective to uh, revoke all previous instruments will actually depend on on the construction of the clause uh, so for example in the case of um, Rue Wayland a testator had made a Belgian will um, which dealt with his assets in Belgium. Subsequent to this, he then made a will in England um, and it had a revocation clause um, which intended to revoke all, all former um, wills. But that English will specifically stated that it was intended to deal only with the English assets um, and the English estate. So it did not therefore, on, on true construction, revoke the Belgian will. So that's just kind of also linking back to my point as to um, earlier I mentioned there may be issues as to sort of foreign wills, foreign property. And it's important to know that it's not sufficient to have in a will a description that it's my last or last and only will without having sort of the express revocation clause. 
um, that sort of description last um, will doesn't by itself operate to revoke, revoke a will. So that's express revocation. Um, where there's no express clause, um, whether a latter will will revoke a former will, uh, generally is a matter of construction. So the court is going to look at the two wills, it's going to look at the latter will and see whether um, they're inconsistent with each other, whether the later will um, merely contains sort of repetitive provisions. And the court's not going to easily conclude where there's no uh, revocation clause that there was um, an intention to revoke. A will um, can be impliedly revoked on an entire basis or it may be partially um, revoked, for example, if there are clauses which are um, partially inconsistent with um, a former will, then it may revoke the former to the extent that there's that inconsistency. And what the court has generally said is the, the question is that is about what dispositions the testator intended to have effect. It's not about which, which will, what, what number of papers, for example, uh, that were intended to be admitted to probate. So as a result of this, any number of um, testamentary papers can actually be admitted to probate together and the court will then read them together. So that's implied. So the next method of replication is the written declaration. So it's summarized in section 20 is by some writing declaring an intention to revoke the same and executed in the manner in which a will is here and before required to be executed. So clearly there's a requirement that the intention is declared and that it complies with the relevant formalities for duly executing a will, um, section nine, and that it's made with capacity without undue influence, those requirements. Otherwise, the, there doesn't seem to be any other limitations on the form or on the content of the document. So, for example, in Re Gosling's goods, um, a case from 1886, the testator had obliterated a whole of the codicil um, with thick black marks, including his signature. He'd then written at the end of the codicil, we are witnesses to the erasure of the above. He'd signed it, it was attested by witnesses, and the court held that the codicil was revoked because there was clearly this in writing declaring the intention to revoke. And I'm not sure how, how, how often this sort of method is seen in practice, and um, I expect not as much as the first. So the third method of revocation, in my view, is probably the most interesting. Um, it sort of conjures up visions of a testator tearing up his will or and then throwing it into a, an open fire. Uh, but again, not, not clear how, how sort of practical relevant it, it is today. Um, but it's sort of summarised by the, the burning, tearing or otherwise destroying the same by the testator or by some person, his or pre her presence and by his or her direction with the intention of revoking the same. So what it requires here is both the act of destruction and also the intention. So you cannot inadvertently destroy a will, uh, nor can you intend to destroy it, but sort of do nothing about it. Neither of those would be um, sufficient to act as a revocation. And uh, there's the words of Lord Justice James in the case of Cheese and Lovejoy, who says, or the destroying in the world without intention will not revoke a will, nor all the intention in the world without destroying. There must be the two. So on the first element, which is the act of destruction, it's the, the original will that has to be destroyed, um, not a copy. Partial destruction may not uh, revoke the entire will unless what's been destroyed is something that is essential, the key component to the will. For example, the signature is burnt off or torn off. And, and, and the examples of destruction obviously given in, in the statute, and it says, you know, or otherwise destroying the same, but it's not sufficient to just strike the contents through of the will um, with a pen or to cross out the signature, nor is it sufficient to just write cancelled um, over the signature. It's also important that the testator has completed the task of destruction, has not sort of started um, the process and then um, not completed it. What I think is quite interesting as well is that it must be carried out by the testator or by a person in their presence under their instruction. And obviously this, in the last year, we've seen changes to how you can witness wills and this kind of change of what presence means. 
Um, so the there've been the electronic changes under um, the order last year about um, presence, meaning by video conference and or other visual transmission. But the same uh, provisions weren't made uh, in respect of section 20. Um, so it looks as though presence is actually in, in actual presence rather than more visual presence. Indeed, telephone presence was not, um, directing someone to destroy it over the telephone was not sufficient. So that's the act of destruction. Um, then there's the intention. Uh, it might be quite difficult to demonstrate that a testator was intending to um, destroy, um, tending to uh, revoke the uh, will through destruction. So we're assisted here by some presumptions, but generally there are three ways in which intention um, can be shown. So there might be an express intention to revoke by evidence. I'm not sure how this might be done now, for example, with the testator recording himself, you know, declaring his intention and then tearing or burning uh, the, the will. Uh, it can be inferred from the state and condition of the destroyed will. And here, as I said, we are assisted by presumption. So if there's a torn or mutilated will and it's found at the testator's um, death, there's, an and there's a presumption that the, that was destroyed with the intention to revoke. The onus is then on the person who's propounding that will um, to show the act was either not done by the testator or that it was done without an intention to revoke. And finally, it can be inferred from intrinsic circumstances. So there may have been declarations that would lead to an inference of an intention to revoke. There's also a rebuttable presumption that a lost will has been um, destroyed with an intention to revoke. Um, see that maybe, um, the strength of that presumption may be very depending on uh, the, the circumstances. So for example, if the testator was very, um, kept his or her wills and sort of locked safe, for example. So that's the sort of three methods under section 20 and uh, I suppose the, the intentional um, methods of, of revocation. Um, the next method of revocation, marriage and civil partnership, is dealt with in sections 18 onwards um, of the Wills Act 1837. So marriage and civil partnership will automatically revoke a will um, that's the, the general position, although it's subject to um, two exceptions, which I'll uh, come on to deal with. A voidable marriage will revoke a will, but uh, a void one will not. The two exceptions um, dealt with in section 18 and then uh, 18b of the Wills Act in relation to civil partnership. Um, so you first have certain appointments made by will. Um, so that will save an appointment by will from revocation by marriage or, or civil partnership, unless the property appointed would in default of appointment pass to the personal representatives. The second exception is where <coughs> the will, they're shown from the will that there's an intention that it will not be revoked by um, a particular marriage or civil partnership. So the will has to, on its face, show that the testator was intending or expecting to be married or enter into a civil partnership with a particular person and that the will or disposition would not be revoked by that intended um, marriage or partnership. And, and there are some exceptions in relation to where um, marriage changes into a civil partnership or civil per partnership and um, sort of changes into a marriage. As I sort of uh, mentioned um, at the beginning, uh, there's been some look at revocation of wills by the Law Commission um, in 2017. And in terms of the first three methods, uh, so the other will, codicil, destruction, and the written declaration, that there wasn't really seen as any um, real need for reform. But the Law Commission has looked at whether the sort of automatic um, revocation under marriage um, is in need of, of reform. And I suppose it, it looks at the practical consequences of um, this automatic revocation. So by default, the, the new spouse or civil partner is likely to be entitled to the majority of the estate if there's no new um, will made um, on the intestacy rules. So the default rule almost appears to favour second families over children from the previous marriage. And the Law Commission have suggested that it, this might actually be inappropriate, uh, reflective of sort of outdated societal norms. 
and especially for sort of cohabitants who don't expect that the will that they make when they're cohabiting is then going to be revoked on marriage on something for which they do not see as a significant lifestyle uh, change that it may actually frustrate their wishes. On the other hand, um, the Law Commission showed that it, it does protect the surviving spouse or civil partner um, where the testator has not then made uh, a new will. So, for example, if the testator made a will while he was in, in a first marriage or civil partnership, and then met someone new, married, entered into sort of civil partnership, um, that previous one would be automatically revoked and so um, protect the uh, current um, spouse or civil partner. Uh, there is obviously an entitlement to claim under the 1975 Act to claim, um, but uh, that could be costly or um, just take quite a long time. The Law Commission also showed that the, the marriage doesn't um, isn't automatic, uh, marriage doesn't automatically revoke uh, wills in, in other jurisdictions. So it's looking at whether marriage can, um, whether this default rule should be abolished or retained. Uh, there's also a, another couple of reforms that we're looking at, but one which I think is quite inter interesting is that there's this conflict between um, the capacity test for marriage and the capacity test for making a will. So a person might have capacity to marry, <clears throat> but then be unable to make the will after marriage. Um, so they propose that perhaps marriage entered into when a testator lacks capacity and is unlikely to then recover the capacity would not subsequently revoke a will. I mean, I'd be interested at the end if anyone has any thoughts on um, or this kind of automatic revocation and, and whether it should be abolished or whether new um, proposals should be made. Um, so that's that's the reform provisions. But uh, what about divorce, dissolution, annulment? So that doesn't actually lead to automatic revocation. So where uh, marriage or civil partnership comes to an end, um, either by dissolution or annulment, and that's recognised, the will takes effect as if the former spouse or civil partner um, has predeceased the testator, unless they've expressed a contrary um, intention in the will. Um, but their rights to obviously claim under the 1975 Act um, are, are preserved um, so they can still claim provision. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Sorry. And uh, as Emma's helpfully introduced, I'm going to speak about proprietary estoppel. I've titled it uh, Proprietary Estoppel and Family Assets. That's because proprietary estoppel is a very big uh, topic. And here I'm going to be focusing mostly on the, the kind of cases which I think are especially common these days where there's a, an argument about um, particularly forward-looking promises about a family home or a, a shared home um, and uh, or shared business. And of course, a um, very common category of cases are farm cases where you've got the home and the business all wrapped up together. Uh, but proprietary stop is about more uh, than just those things. So what I'm going to go through is I'm going to discuss the legal principles of proprietary estoppel. I'm going to be fairly brief on that. Uh, there are plenty of good textbooks on the subject. In fact, there's one uh, textbook just about proprietary estoppel um, by Ben McFarlane, which is uh, particularly useful because it goes into more depth than most of the others. But uh, I will run through them. Um, I'm going to identify some of the typical categories of cases that you may see. And um, then I'm going to spend some time talking about what I think you should be thinking about when you're trying to weigh up whether a, a client's potential claim or a, a claim that a client is facing, uh, whether the claim is any good. And if it's some good, what is the likely result going to be? Because one thing I'm going to cover in more detail is just how flexible uh, the outcome can be uh, and therefore how difficult to predict. I'm going to uh, focus a bit on a particular complication which I've come across recently, which is what effect it has on a, an otherwise meritorious claim if after the claim has arisen, the parties which are involved enter into an agreement between themselves, a contractual agreement or a deed, uh, which doesn't reflect everything that has been promised or thought or discussed. Uh, whether that kills off the claim or if it doesn't kill it off altogether, how big a problem it is. Uh, that's uh, an unresolved issue, uh, which makes it something to watch out for uh, in particular. Uh, then I'm going to spend some time talking about remedies, which is of special importance given just how flexible they can be. 
And then I'm going to wrap up uh, with a brief bit on a complication that can arise where you haven't just got someone making promises and someone receiving the promises. You've got a third party in the mix as well, who also has an interest in the property and whether the estoppel claim will be binding on them as well. Okay, so there's an awful lot of case law on proprietary estoppel. Uh, it's been around as an idea for a very long time. It's been developed. Uh, it's become, I, I think, increasingly common as a kind of claim. And uh, so you can read reams and reams of material in the case law about how the principles work. And uh, one thing that emerges from this is that some people regard it as a, a single doctrine uh, and some people regard it as in reality having slightly different principles that have a sort of family resemblance between themselves, but where the ingredients are not quite the same. However, I think what pretty much everyone can agree on is what the House of Lords said in the Thorner and Major case, which is still the, the, the leading case on proprietary estoppel. And uh, that is that you can boil it down to three elements. You need the making of a representation or assurance to the claimant. That's how they put it in the Thorner and Major judgment. But it's quite a broad idea, this representation or assurance. It can be everything from an explicit promise, um, either a unilateral promise uh, or a promise with a quid pro quo, or in some cases, mere acquiescence can suffice, so a kind of implicit representation. So it's a very broad um, idea, representation or assurance. Second thing you need is that the recipient has to rely on it. It doesn't matter what they've been told if they haven't done anything in consequence. And the third is that as a result of their reliance, they have to have suffered some detriment. And it has to be a, a meaningful or substantial detriment. Uh, and uh, it has to be, not surprisingly, uh, reasonably incurred. Uh, you can't have a promise and then do something completely crazy and unforeseeable and say, well, I've now suffered detriment. That, that won't do it. Uh, in practical terms, uh, when I'm thinking about these cases, I tend to distill it down to two uh, elements, the representation or assurance, and then I run the other two together as detrimental reliance. Uh, I think in practical terms, when you think about the case, you've got those two major areas, yeah, ingredients two and three, difficult to separate out, really. Um, one thing, as you might have guessed from the uh, name of the principle, it has to be about property. So something that doesn't deal with property at all isn't going to engage a claim here. However, uh, it is the idea of property in pretty much its widest possible sense. And I've given you an example of the case of Rebasham, where there was a successful claim where the subject matter of the claim was the entire residue of an estate. So that wasn't just a physical asset, although it did include a cottage, but it was the estate as a whole, which would obviously include things that you might not necessarily, wouldn't necessarily spring to mind when you're thinking about property. Uh, other things like uh, bank accounts and so on. So it is property in a wide sense. Um, it's also quite an untechnical sense. So one thing's in Thorner and Major. There was a debate about, uh, that's one of the many farming cases, Thorner and Major. And the representations were all about the farm. And what the farm was varied from time to time. And you'll see this very often in farming cases, that they, they sell off bits for development value, they buy new bits of land, and, uh, and so on. Uh, sometimes they'll buy a whole new other farms elsewhere. And in Thorner and Major, that was held not to be a problem. The idea of the farm was clear enough. So although it has to be about property, it's not a particularly stringently applied concept. Um, one thing you've got to remember is uh, this is a, an equitable principle. So it's not like a tort claim where you've got the ingredients and as long as you can establish each of the ingredients, uh, you then succeed. Uh, so although it's helpful to break it down into elements, it's actually a, a bit more um, rough and ready than that. Um, delving into the principles a bit more, uh, I've cited a paragraph 
this is one of the most cited uh, paragraphs about on the subject. Uh, that paragraph of the judgment of Lord Justice Lewison in Davies and Davies, yet another farming case, uh, gets cited an awful lot as it collects together in a, a brief form some of the not controversial propositions about proprietary estoppel, uh, a central reading if you were doing one of these cases. I'm just going to draw out a couple of uh, the points. Uh, although I've referred to the elements of it, because it's an equitable doctrine, there is this overarching idea of unconscionability. So that has a, a couple of consequences. Firstly, as I've said already, it's not the case that as long as you can say something on each of the elements and say, well, we've got these elements, then you win. You've still got to satisfy the court that it would be unconscionable to deny you the relief. Um, you will very often be able to do that if you can satisfy the three elements because that's what they're there for. We, we can all readily grasp that. Uh, if you've been promised something or assured that you'll get something, and then in reliance on that, you make your position worse. One, one can see how it would be unfair or unconscionable for the uh, promise to be retracted. That, that's the basic idea, but it's not, it's not a guarantee. The other consequence is that the three elements can't just be compartmentalized. So you can't talk only about representation or assurance. And then once you're done with that, move on to detriment uh, as if you, you no longer need to be taking into account the representation or assurance. It's um, necessary to take a, a global view. And uh, the way this really shows up is that the clearer and more emphatic the representation or assurance, perhaps you can get away with less in terms of detrimental reliance. And it goes the other way around. If you've got a relatively vague or it was a shifting uh, assurance about what would happen, perhaps with various provisos, then you'll need to have more to say on detrimental reliance if the claim is going to be a good one. Um, also, there's the concept of the minimum equity. So it's not the case that you, if your claim succeeds, then you get what you were represented or assured you would get, because everything is about unconscionability in proprietary estoppel that the court will consider what is the minimum that's required to avoid the unconscionable result. Um, it's not that rigorously applied. Uh, the, the word minimum suggests it, it's really parsimonious. There are plenty of cases where the claimant gets everything that they were, um, that they expected to get based on what they were told. But there are also plenty of cases where they get a lot less. Uh, perhaps, um, a better way of understanding it, and one that comes up in case law a lot, is the idea that has to, there's an element of proportionality. Uh, that maybe more uh, readily reflects what actually happens in the cases than the idea of the minimum equity. But you see both formulations. What they're both getting at is you don't necessarily get everything you've been promised. Uh, something else that's important to bear in mind is that until the court adjudicates on it, none of it is set in stone. Uh, circumstances can change, and I'll be coming on to this a bit more later on. And it, it can happen, for instance, that at one point in time, the representations and assurances you've had, and your detrimental reliance on them, means that if adjudicated then, if you had the court case then, you would succeed and get some relief. But then later on, things change, and your claim would no longer be a good one, and that the court would give no relief at all. Uh, that can and does happen. So you've got to be alive to the changing circumstances. Uh, it's not in the bag once you satisfy the elements. Uh, if, if things move on, uh, the claim might cease to be a good one. And there are two key points in time. The first is when the person who's given the representations or assurances uh, seeks to go back on them. Uh, quite often, this is uh, because quite often these cases are about what someone will inherit. So quite often that is when they die and their will comes to light and it doesn't do what the, person, the other person's expecting. So that's the, but it could also happen in lifetime. Uh, people change their plans. So that's one key time when the, the representations assurances, party giving them seeks to go back on them. The second is when the case comes to trial and is actually decided on by the court. So the court will take into account circumstances in between.
I mentioned that people uh, slice and dice the principle in different ways. Uh, one of the probably most convincing ways people divide it up is by trying to categorize the representation or assurance. These aren't completely hard and fast categories. Um, probably be a mistake to say that you're definitely in one category rather than another. There are shades of gray. But broadly speaking, you can talk about, first of all, acquiescence cases. Uh, this is where, uh, th this is possibly the longest lived uh, kind of proprietary estoppel case. I've referred you to um, the 1880 decision of Wilmot and Barber. Uh, this is where the representation or assurance is effectively implicit. It, it comes by someone standing by while they see what you're doing. Um, they understand that you're making a, an assumption or that you have a belief about your rights and they're aware of their contrary right, but they don't do anything to um, assert their contrary right. Um, tends to happen in um, sort of real properties, sort of tangible property cases, uh, where, for example, someone um, blocks up an access way on the assumption that they have another access way which leads over your land, and uh, the assumption that they're going to be able to, that they have a right to travel over your land to uh, the public highway. And if you stand by and let them block up their alternative access way, um, knowing that uh, they don't have a right over your land and that you're going to uh, prevent them from getting out that way so they'll be landlocked. That's the kind of situation where you tend to see acquiescence cases. Uh, then there's a second category of representation cases where so the person's made an express representation about current rights. The third category is different and this is what now gets most attention I think. And this tends to be more forward looking. It's not so much about a representation of the situation as it is at the time. It's about what will happen in the future. And uh, sometimes these are gratuitous promises about the future. Uh, and sometimes they're, uh, they come close, although they aren't, they, but they come close to contractual bargains. If you do this, this and this, uh, you will eventually get such and such a thing. Um, often after the person making the assurance or promise has died. Uh, these cases um, do seem to get the most attention. Now, I'm, I'm gonna focus mainly on cases of that kind, the, the forward looking cases. Um, but one thing that's worth bearing in mind is if you are doing one of those cases, you don't want to get too bogged down in the cases about acquiescence and representation about current rights. Those won't necessarily be a good guide for you. And you don't need to get bogged down in them because there's lots and lots of cases about assurances and promises. Um, here are some of the kinds of factual situation which can arise. Uh, I've already touched on the idea of neighboring landowners. Um, that will very often be about existing rights and quite often be about acquiescence. Uh, I was doing one um, earlier this year though, where it was a landlord and tenant case and it concerned uh, giving permission for an extension. Uh, there was an upper floor maisonette and the owner of the maisonette wanted to build, wanted to extend into the loft space. And they were given permission by the landlord, but the, the paperwork was done badly. And so it didn't confer on them. Uh, uh, it, didn't, it didn't extend their lease to include the loft space, which they were building into. But it seemed to me that was a kind of proprietary estoppel claim. Um, second kind of factual situation which often arises is focused on a residential house and you very often see the situation where someone is expecting to get the house in return for providing care and other assistance to the person whose house it is. Very often um, an elderly family member, um, I think I most often see this with parents, uh, but not always. Uh, I've referred you to the case of Jennings and Rice, which is an important one, uh, can be other kinds of acquaintances. You tend to see that more where someone doesn't have close family. And um, where you've got those kind of cases, it's worth particularly focusing on what other opportunities the person has given up, because that's kind of detrimental reliance, which is more likely to, 
give you a really good claim. Because if you've just been providing care and assistance, you might face the counter argument, well, you should be compensated for that, but you shouldn't necessarily uh, get the whole house. Third kind of situation uh, is family businesses, uh, not just farms, but very often farms. And these generate lots of cases, um, particularly in recent years, and, uh, which I think is probably because uh, farming families tend to be quite tight knit. You often have the dynamic where there's one or two children who are interested in going into farming and so do go into farming and spend their whole life doing that where you've got one or more other children who are not so invested in the farm and are more interested in uh, cashing out. And you often see informal dealings between farming families, the members of them. And of course, uh, the real economic driver is how valuable land has become, um, particularly if the land has potential development value. The capital assets of a farm can very easily be millions of pounds, even though it doesn't generate that much income. So um, you get quite a tricky situation to unravel where some people are very committed to carry on the farm, even though it's not particularly lucrative in terms of income. And other people are a lot more interested in getting their share of, their cap of the capital assets. Uh, lots of cases about this. Uh, I'm gonna touch on a few of them. Uh, another recent example that's gone to the Court of Appeal is guest and guest, referred to there. And if you are doing one of these, it's uh, worth reading so I think all the ones since Thorner and Major that have gone to the Court of Appeal, because although they're all farming cases and you can draw parallels between them, they are quite factually different. And it, it really brings home to you if you read them, how the different facts carry forward to very different outcomes. In some cases, people are awarded all the assets of the farm outright, running into millions of pounds. And in some, they get just a, a cash payment uh, often very much less than the value of the farm. Uh, one kind of case you won't see uh, is commercial transactions. And that's because of the uh, decision in Cobb and Yeoman's Row, where a property developer was uh, trying to rely on um, an agreement in principle and effectively make it binding through proprietary estoppel. Uh, that was not successful. So if you're dealing with commercial parties entering into commercial transaction, you are not likely to gain assistance from proprietary estoppel. You see uh, categories two and three, which I've been talking about here, very often informal dealings among families. Right, so the next subject I wanted to talk about is what particular points I, I would suggest you focus on when you're trying to weigh up the merits of the claim. Um, uh, this first page is mainly focused on the nature of the representations and assurances. And uh, not surprisingly, uh, top priority is try and explore how clear and consistent the recollection is of what was actually said. Um, and consistency uh, shouldn't be overlooked because quite often what happens is people have, the person giving the representation of insurance has said slightly different things at slightly different times. So you have a sort of shifting picture. That's that's not fatal. Uh, there are plenty of successful cases where that, that was the situation, but you do need to identify it because it would be a mistake to identify the, the most favorable assurance and then sort of forget about the ones which were more caveated, uh, more limited in their scope. Because if those exist as well, uh, they are going to go into the mix and you're not necessarily going to get everything you hoped for based on the best assurance. Uh, but clarity of the evidence as well, uh, because what I tend to find is clients very readily say things like, it was always understood that such and such would happen. Um, that isn't necessarily going to work. You do need to uh, explore what actually they're going to say, what, what the evidence of fact is. Uh, just their impression of what was going to happen or something they may have assumed it isn't going to get you home. You need to focus on facts of what was actually said and done by the person who allegedly gave the assurances. Uh, now, you can, if the facts are right, get away with something that is very um, 
very intangible. So Thorno and Major is probably the best example of this, where it was found that the, the individuals in that case were especially taciturn. So they didn't really ever have a conversation where they, they sat down and talked about the future of the farm. But it was found in that case that having regard to the nature of those individuals and the nature of things that they said, which were on a, a premise that the farm would be passed on, that uh, that was sufficient to a, that was a sufficiently clear assurance in those quite unusual circumstances. Uh, so you can have a case like that, but you, you shouldn't assume that because it worked in Thorner Major it will work in your case. Uh, it's very easy for a judge to say, well, I find in your case these people would have talked about it if it was a serious assurance and you haven't got any evidence of that. So you can very easily lose on that and don't get beguiled by, by what happened in Thorner and Major. And it occurs to me, uh, I imagine many of you will now have come across the new practice direction about witness statements for trial, where they're supposed to be less lawyered, less uh, what you hope the client's evidence would be, and closer to examination in chief. If you do that properly, you might find that when it comes down to it, the client is not able to be at all concrete in their evidence about what they were told. So I think this is something that may be exposed more readily uh, now that practice direction has come in. Um, on the other hand, uh, something that used to happen before is you'd get a, a really ambitious witness statement where it says it in no uncertain terms that I was promised this and that. Uh, and then when it comes to cross-examination, it, it is discovered that really they can't identify any occasions at all where a promise was made. It was more something that they um, assumed or it was an impression they had. Um, so maybe the press direction would be helpful in flushing that out sooner. But certainly if you're doing all these cases, this is something you want to be focusing on right at the outset. Uh, really try and pin down the, what the evidence is going to be about what was said. Because uh, one of the other problems you can have is where you set out in pre-action correspondence one set of recollections about what was said. And then when you come to plead the case, you do something slightly differently. And then when you have your witness evidence, it's slightly different again. And then when you come to trial, the um, oral evidence doesn't quite match up any of the previous versions. If you have such conflicting versions, that, that can really quite badly undermine your case. So, so trying to do the exercise thoroughly at the outset is important. And uh, it's worth really exploring with the client the kind of occasions when the future might have been discussed. Was there, if it, if it's a family business, for instance, was there a, a major business decision? Because that changed the facts on the ground. Because if there was, that's the kind of occasion when there might have been a conversation about the future, uh, that kind of thing. Or if there's a major life event, like um, suppose a family business owned by parents and then they get divorced. That's the kind of thing that can spark a conversation about the future. So it's worth really taking the time to explore with your clients what, they get, what their evidence is going to be. Uh, and don't just um, take instructions that they will promise such and such a thing and then just go from there. You really do need the detail. Um, similar vein, uh, worth um, turning a skeptical eye to what the client's going to say. At the end of the day, the judge is going to decide on this. And one thing the judge is going to bear in mind is inherent likelihoods. So try and think through what factors in the case are going to point towards or against the court finding that the, the evidence is true. And uh, personalities of the individuals can be important. It's very important, Thorner and Major, uh, but also the, the circumstances, whether there were any events where if the promises had been made, they would have been discussed then. Uh, another thing to watch out for is you can, can get cases where clients tell you that they've been promised such and such thing, but when you do drill down into it, it what they come up with sounds a lot more like a, a statement of something that was intended to happen in the future, but hardly a cast iron promise. Uh, and people will often talk about the future, but without intending to make a, a concrete promise or 
an assurance that you can go away and uh, reorganize your life on the strength of it. So that's something to watch out for. And in a related vein, if, um, if you are going to be bringing your case on the basis that what was being said was really important and was, it was understood that it was going to be relied on in a big way, um, worth asking the question why it wasn't formalized. Uh, very often the answer will be these were family members and they just trusted each other and they didn't think any legal formalities were necessary. But it's a question that will probably be in the judge's mind, so it should be in your mind too. Uh, lastly, on this subject, um, as part of your exploration of the evidence, you'll want to think through whether there were any qualifications um, to what was being said about the future, and not necessarily just express ones. Uh, for instance, uh, again, uh, very often comes up in the farming context, if you have, uh, say, two siblings, one of them is going to go into the farm, um, in farming as a career, and they say they were promised the farm. Um, it's worth exploring whether the um, person make, doing the promising was intending that they have the entire farm for free and therefore perhaps leaving very little for the other sibling. It's worth exploring that because um, there are cases where um, the facts as they were found involve assurances, yes, being given that you'll get the property or you'll have an opportunity to have the property but subject to a condition that other people be provided for. Uh, sometimes the spouse of the person making the promise, sometimes other siblings, uh, etc. So that's something that's important to explore. Because again, the question of unconscionability, weighing up other people's interests is, is going to come into, into the balance. Uh, moving on, slightly, focusing more on the question of detrimental reliance. Um, as I was saying earlier, changes of circumstances are important. Uh, probably the most important kind of change of circumstance you can have is where the recipient of the promises assurances uh, was supposed to do something in return. And they've not kept up their end of the bargain. Uh, that is going to seriously weaken the claim. Um, not necessarily fatally. Uh, you can get situations where they were trying to keep up the end, their end of the bargain but the working relationship just became too bad and it wasn't all their fault. Uh, but that may well limit what they're going to get because they haven't done everything they're expected to do in return for getting what they're promised. Uh, but it's not just that, other changes of circumstances as well. Uh, you really do need to think about the facts of your case. Another thing that I, I find often causes people problems is trying to weigh up the detriment. And you've got to weigh it against any benefits you got as a result. So um, in the case of where someone moves into a house and does provides care and assistance, they will very often not be paying any rent uh, and so, whereas they might've been before. So they do have that benefit living there rent free and that does need to be factored in. And uh, I find that I see quite a lot of these cases where the pre-action letters and even the statements of case can't really identify much in the way of detriment. And I, what I see a lot is people doing particulars of detrimental reliance, which involve relatively small scale household maintenance. Uh, I have even seen uh, changing the light bulbs uh, put as detrimental reliance, which I don't think is gonna convince anybody. Um, and things like mowing the lawn, likewise, you're not going to be awarded a house in return for doing things like that. That's the kind of thing which might well be expected of someone who's living in the property. Uh, likewise, paying the electricity bills or contributing towards them. If you've been using the electricity, uh, paying something towards the bills is only really to be expected. It's not an enormous detriment to your suffering and therefore you ought to be uh, awarded uh, a large claim. Uh, slightly better is spending money on the property. At least that has spending money to improve the property, especially. Uh, that has more substance to it. But the difficulty with that is it does lend itself rather easily to the answer, well, two answers. First of all, you're partly getting the benefit of this while you're living there. 
Okay, it's not just money that's going down the drain. And the second is, well, very well, may, maybe you should be protected and have a claim, but why shouldn't it just be giving you your money back? Why should you get more than that? So I think a, a lot of fairly weak claims are, are advanced. And if your client is in this kind of situation, they can't really point to any significant detriment. It's important to be realistic. Uh, you're not likely to be awarded a house outright if you're in this kind of category. Um, another way I can go is if lots of detriment has been incurred, but it wasn't reasonable to incur it. So someone's been promised they will um, inherit their parents' house. So they sell their own house uh, quickly and not at a great price and then squander the proceeds because they think they won't need it because they're going to inherit a house. Uh, that's not likely to be regarded as reasonable reliance. It's not likely to be regarded as something which makes it unconscionable for the person who said that you will inherit my house to change their mind. I say, well, didn't ask you to uh, change your position in this way. That's just something you've done. You've taken the risk, uh, not necessarily a risk that the person giving the assurance could have foreseen. Uh, so that's another problem the case can find. I find that comes up a lot less often, but it does sometimes. And then lastly, you have the particular issue of, you might have a meritorious claim, but then the parties subsequently entered into a written agreement, which doesn't reflect the substance of your claim. Now, I'll come onto this in more detail, but if you don't have something quite convincing to say about this, that's gonna be a major problem for the claim. Um, however, it's not, there's still a live controversy about how much of an effect it actually has. And in my view, the answer is that it's fact sensitive. Uh, and one has to regard whether on the facts of that particular case, the parties in question entering into the agreement they did in the circumstances they did, do those facts undermine the representations and assurances and the detrimental reliance and do they mean it's no longer unconscionable to go back on what was promised? A uh, couple, couple of cases on this. Whitaker and Kinnear is um, on the, I think it's probably the, the best case which is actually on this, but it, the real difficulty here is there's an absence of case law on this point. Uh, in this case, it was held that um, someone had sold the house uh, on the strength of assurances by the buyer but the sale contract didn't record all those assurances. It was found that they shouldn't be summarily disposed of, which I think tends to suggest that there's no hard and fast rule. Um, on the other hand, in Horsford and Horsford, yet another farming case, uh, here the parties had entered into a partnership deed and the point of excite entering into this deed was so that the uh, parties seeking to rely on proprietary estoppel could buy out the assets. Uh, but then he wanted to bring this claim that uh, he should be able to have the assets without paying for them. Uh, that claim failed. It failed for various reasons. Uh, so it didn't even get this far. So it's actually um, not a binding part of the decision in Horsford and Horsford. But it was held that if the claim had got that far, entering into a, a subsequent agreement which was inconsistent with the claim would have killed off the claim. Uh, for what it's worth, I think the key is whether it's inconsistent or whether the subsequent agreement is compatible with the representations or assurances. Um, we might get some more guidance on this. A case I've recently been involved in uh, had a lot on this issue. Um, we should have judgment uh, at some point later this year. Um, running short on time, so I'll go through remedy fairly quickly. Uh, the main point to notice is the court has a great deal of flexibility. Um, quite often the remedies are that someone should just get an asset or it should be paid a sum of money uh, but another option is a fixed charge secured against the property, as in Campbell and Griffin. And then in the farm case, more and more, uh, the judge came up with something really elaborate. Um, now, this was overturned on appeal, but not on the basis that the court couldn't do this. It was on the basis that the court shouldn't in the circumstances. Uh, it's quite an elaborate arrangement where um, the claimant was to be transferred the partnership interest but subject to various provisos, because this was a case where there were always provisos that um, the parents should be provided for 
And so the judge was doing his best to reflect those. Uh, the Court of Appeal, however, thought that in the circumstance of the case, uh, a clean break solution uh, was required. And so this was remitted. Now, I don't think there's a report of the eventual decision that was made, but I imagine it was a much simpler award in the end. But in principle, the court could do something really complicated like this. Um, when you're trying to assess what kind of remedy you're going to get, I would suggest you particularly focus on the following. Uh, the clarity of the expectation, um, uh, obviously looked at reasonably. How clear and consistent was the expectation? Did it vary over time uh, or not? Uh, secondly, how long the expectation has been held? Obviously, the longer it's been held, reasonably held, uh, the stronger the claim is likely to be. Uh, next, the seriousness of the detriment um, weighed against any benefits. Now, I've separated out the next point, which is whether the detriment incurred was part of a bargain. If you do this, you'll get that. Um, I think that is tend to be a weightier factor than where the detriment is separate. Uh, something that the person did um, because of what they're expecting to get, but not in return for getting it. Uh, I think where you've got a quid pro quo, that's particularly important. Uh, changes of circumstances, uh, particularly where the original idea can't be carried out, because very often uh, the idea is that everyone will remain on friendly terms, so that uh, the farm, for example, the farm will carry on with parents and claimant working together for as long as the parents are alive, and then the claimant will inherit. But if they fall out and can no longer work together, you need to do something different instead. Uh, so that was like him more and more. And then you want to think about how it's going to work in practice. So that was part of the problem and more and more. It was just too complicated to make it work. And that includes uh, the tax consequences. Uh, very briefly to wrap up, third parties. Uh, something that can happen is the property is in the hands of the person who is not the person who's given you the assurances. Um, Haberfield and Haberfield chose one way of dealing with this. Uh, here it was the father who'd actually given the assurances but it was found that the mother had known about them and had authorized them. This wasn't dealt with in a lot of detail, but if you can say it was like this, if, I think it works best with, um, with married couples in a family case. Um, you might well be able to see that the, um, the other spouse knew all about what was being promised and was content for it to be promised, in which case consequences might be the same. Um, so that rather, that dealt with the point quite neatly. But I can see that being more controversial in other cases. And then there's also a technical answer, which is that if the equity has arisen, so you've had your assurances and you've had your detrimental reliance, then although it's still up in the air until it's actually decided on by the court, it can bind successors in title. And I've referred you to the relevant section of the Act and a case on this. So the fact that the assets have gone to someone else doesn't necessarily prevent you bringing a claim against them. Um, you'll have to analyze it um, because if they're, if they're bought it, the assets for value without notice, probably not gonna be bound. But um, quite often, for instance, um, assets might have been inherited by someone for free. You might well be able to bring the claim against them. So that's a little bit on third parties, uh, but it's complication it's worth paying attention to because you, you will need to have an answer to it. So I've now covered all the ground I was going to. Um, so we've got a question about uh, revocation of wills on marriage and what happens if the testator is, is domiciled abroad, um, for example, in a jurisdiction where marriage does not automatically uh, revoke a person's will. So thanks, thanks for that very interesting question. Um, I think a lot could be said about uh, revocation where there are different jurisdictions. So I'll just try to be quite concise um, with a very brief answer, but... Um, where persons are domiciled abroad, the validity of the revoc revocation um, generally depends on the method um, and whether the will disposes of immovables or movables. But um, Williams, Mortimer and Sonnex have quite helpfully um, said that if revocation is by subsequent marriage, um, then it's governed by the law of the deceased domicile at the time of the marriage. And this is on the basis that the question is actually concerned with matrimonial um, rather than testamentary law. So I hope that answers your question.
Okay, um, right. So anonymous attendee asks, uh, we have two cohabitants, they buy a property and they execute a declaration of trust at the time, which specifies what's going to happen to the surplus proceeds uh, when the property is sold. But later on, uh, one of them contributes a lot of money to extend the property, increasing its value. And it said that there was um, an oral agreement that the person spending that money could be repaid what they'd spent before um, the surplus sale proceeds are divided up. And the question is whether the original agreement is going to prevail uh, or whether a proprietary estoppel uh, might work. Um, so the first thing you need to do is construe the original agreement. It, it might be you can construe it in a way so that it catches future expenditure as well as expenditure at the outset, but that might not be the case. It might actually spell out how much everyone contributed to the purchase and say you get back that much and then the surplus is divided equally. Um, so question of the first question is, is what the original agreement provides for. Uh, but supposing it is not helpful to the person who spent the money, uh, as I expect you'll know, um, this, the existence of the declaration of trust kills off a common intention constructive trust claim. You can't do it if there's an express declaration. However, you can do, and the case law is clear about this, you can rely on a proprietary estoppel to get around it. And if you have an express agreement that um, if someone spends money extending the property and increasing its value, then they will get that back before the division of the sale of proceeds, then uh, I would thought that could give rise to proprietary estoppel in principle. I don't see there's any rule against that. Uh, next question, Eleanor asks, does the detriment have to be financial for proprietary estoppel? And the answer to that is no. Uh, it does have to be something substantial, but um, quite often you'll get it in the form of giving up career opportunities. Uh, this tends to come up very often with the farming cases, but it can be elsewhere. Uh, for example, in the case where someone's providing care, if they start providing full-time care uh, instead of progressing their career, uh, that could be very significant detrimental reliance. You can still reckon that in financial terms, I suppose, but it is not spending money. Um, so, and also just doing work uh, can again be sufficient. So even though you could put a value on it, and it's probably worth thinking uh, when trying to weigh it up, how much of a value would it be appropriate to put, it, put on it? But no, it's not just things that can be easily translated into money. Uh, detriment is quite a wide concept. Um, Laura asks, do I have some case law on the point regarding someone selling their property and spending the money as not constituting reliance detriment? I'm just dealing with that exact point. Uh, I don't think I can give you a case right at the moment, but um, what you can find in all leading cases uh, tends to be done quite briefly, is that the reliance has to be reasonable. Uh, so that's the, the key. So someone squandering their own assets is unlikely to be reasonable unless they were encouraged to do it. Um, probably can't be any more specific than that at the moment. Uh, there may well be reported cases dealing with this exact point, but uh, I think that's what you'll have to look at. Um, but of course, uh, cases where this happens tend to be relatively weak cases. Uh, so well-advised parties are not likely to fight it all the way through to trial. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. We had a really, really great turnout today. Um, hope you've enjoyed the tutorial. Yes, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.